Hi everybody, this lecture we are going to be focusing on the age of inquiry. Now it's during this time in roughly the 1100 um, CE era that we see the origination and development of Gothic style architecture. Uh, architecture. And it's with abbeys and churches primarily that we uh, find this type of uh, architecture. But this is also a very important period in history for not just uh, architecture, but also just art, literature, and an important aspect to history of just our knowledge and reasoning. And so we begin with stained glass windows, something that came out of this kind of a Gothic time period. You can see in this image the ornate and um, vibrant use of blues and reds to uh, create this impressive window. And these, like many other kind of artistic or architectural um, creations, were meant not just as aesthetically pleasing, but also to symbolize really the advancement, um, the superiority of a kind of building style of a, a, a civilization as it transitioned into this kind of um, age of inquiry, into this uh, time of enlightenment, um, which we see later on uh, in, in world history. And it's with these stained glass windows and uh, creations where we get a very kind of immensely complex style of art when we think of this type of uh, a very mosaic style of art, right? Really creating these pieces of art with different colored pieces of glass connecting to create this um, intricate image. And it's with these architectural innovations that really uh, freed up walls within architectural structures and created a more light, uh, airy window wall. And so the rose window um, is perhaps one of the most transparent, the ones that we just saw, symbolizing the Virgin Mary in her role kind of as the mystic rose. And so we see these depicting very kind of biblical um, scenes. Another real key innovation with Gothic architecture is also the kind of ribbed vaulting, the, the ceilings of cathedrals, of buildings that really replace the kind of Roman tick style architecture uh, of the stonework. Um, and it's these patterns of, of ribs and windows that create more space or, or create a feeling of, of more open space. And again, just the intricateness of uh, building architecture, uh, a civilization to create these types of very complex architectural feats, something um, that seem very impressive given the technology at the time and the tools and um, machinery that is being used to really create these, right? Not necessarily machinery that we think of today um, with metal and engines, but really just the types of scaffolding and bricklaying that needs to be uh, done to create these types of kind of vaulted arches. Uh, another big aspect that goes into these kind of ribbed ceilings or uh, architectural feats of the Gothic style of architecture is the flying buttress. We see these again with cathedrals mostly, um, the type of uh, archways that connect into the outside of the building, which helps really spread the weight 
of the vaults over more supporting stone. So we're able to kind of create these incredibly vaulted ceilings by by putting support on the sides in in a in a larger arch, um, really kind of putting pressure on the top aspect or putting pressure on the top pieces so that it doesn't necessarily cave in. And it's with these vaults um, and supporting stone that allow the walls to to really be thinner um, and and lighter in order to to create these architectural feats. In addition, we see types of sculptures. Um, Gothic sculptors really kind of begin reintroducing um, classical principles uh, of sculpture composition in, into Western art. Again, we see this on the outside of, of cathedrals and churches, um, often depicting kind of biblical scenes or uh, biblical characters. And really just kind of the individual bodies and animated facial expressions to kind of tell the story of the characters being depicted on the outside or sometimes inside um, of these cathedrals or churches. Now, with the architecture, there also is a great influence coming out of the, the Gothic period uh, within these cathedrals and churches. And that's really the, the music that is being um, played and sung within these kind of church settings. And when we look at the type of architecture of the Gothic period, we see that there is a level of acoustics as well that really gives rise to the kind of sound that you might hear in one of these old cathedral buildings or these old churches, this resonating sound that kind of echoes and um, is louder and crisper and clearer because the architecture helps to allow those types of acoustics. And so it's really a multi-purposed type of architectural creation that we see in this Gothic period that again is not just an aesthetic kind of um, aesthetically pleasing type of construction but like many things that we've looked at in this course and seen throughout uh, civilizations and the development of civilizations it's this kind of multi-purpose use for whatever it is that's being created. We also see that uh, the quadrivium, um, a, a branch of arts curriculum uh, focused on these types of music or this type of music um, that we often see within these cathedrals and churches, as well as uh, branches of study such as astronomy, geometry, arithmetic, and this is in contrast to the regular trivium that focused primarily on things like language arts, grammar, rhetoric, and so forth. And it's with these kind of curriculum and uh, origination of um, unified study programs that we see in the 12th century, the, the rise of the university. Um, not necessarily something that was developed and created during this time period, we often see um, most popularly uh, schools of thought um, being created in ancient Greece with Plato's Academy and Aristotle's Lyceum. Um, but it's in this 12th century that it really, um, within Italy and France and England, we see the development and popularity of these centers of learning um, that become the, the modern day university. We see this with the University of Bologna. We see this with uh, the University of Paris, Oxford and Cambridge in England. Uh, some of the, the older, more traditional universities. And it's at these universities, particularly uh, University of Paris, that we see some big named uh, philosophical thinkers um, 
uh, logicians come out of and teach for um, the university system. Perhaps one of the most famous in the University of Paris was St. Thomas Aquinas, a, a theologian, lecturer, um, a scholar who is the um, patron saint of education, someone who primarily focused on religion, but also incorporated aspects of logic within um, his philosophy and rationale. Um, and at these universities, we, we often see uh, the focus being on a kind of a dialectic method, this kind of method of learning that we see back in 300, 400 BCE in ancient Greece with Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. And it's not just the men being educated. There also is an education of, of women as well. Um, now, there are obviously going to be certain exceptions, women not being allowed into certain universities. Um, however, um, there are a major works and push for an education of women. Primarily, we see this in Italy. Um, and uh, certain publica publicated works, um, such as On the Diseases of Women, that are really attributed to this kind of educational process that is not just for men. And going back to St. Thomas Aquinas and, and scholasticism, we see that um, scholars at the time um, a big push to really kind of create this summa, a uh, kind of um, authoritative summary um, on traditional subjects that every man was, um, every scholastic uh, educated um, individual was, was really expected to put out. And for Thomas Aquinas, uh, it's his Summa Theologica that becomes the most famous and most influential. Now, even though we, I mentioned the idea that Aquinas became the patron saint of education and uh, had a, a great influence based on this writing, it, it wasn't something that was necessarily widely accepted at the time and is something that kind of grew and developed over the centuries. In fact, now when we look at arguments for the existence of God and religion, uh, theological arguments, we see that some of the most profound and, and lasting arguments come from St. Thomas Aquinas uh, with his development of kind of the five ways or uh, five uh, different arguments, teleological and cosmological arguments, that really put forth a kind of logical rationale for the existence of God. Now it's in these Southern regions of Europe that we see the church not really having a big influence. And so in the 13th century, the Pope really um, influences the Southern region um, by kind of retaliating against this, um, kind of government guild controlled regions um, and establishes a principled power within Tuscany to kind of reign over the region. And so with Siena established with Siena establishing itself in the 12th century as kind of a, this free commune, um, the, the prospect of freedom, really uh, attracted a, a large number of people to this region. And it was Florence that became extremely wealthy, uh, an area based on trade, and became a very kind of economic hub in the southern region of Italy at the time. And so lots of investment uh, lots of capital, lots of trade it came through this region in the south. And so you can see why the Pope at the time wanted to have such a tight grasp 
on these regions, not just economically, but also just influentially. Um, we see uh, throughout civilization the impact that um, it can be had on regions um, through things like trade, through things like uh, economics and uh, a type of kind of imperialistic economy. Now, while this was happening, we kind of come back to the kind of artistic aspect of this kind of age of inquiry. Um, and in Siena, Florence, we see a kind of growing naturalism um, when it comes to art and painting, particularly um, focusing on kind of these religious characters and influences, um, the Virgin Mary, for instance. And these paintings would have this magnificently um, uh, detailed depiction of religious characters that became quite vibrant and um, representative of this particular time period. Uh, similarly with art, we also see the influence in, in things like literature, Dante's Divine Comedy, for instance. Um, authors across Europe began to write uh, in the vernacular, the language spoken in the streets, again, something that was not typical of the time. And so it's with Dante's Divine Comedy that really records kind of the travels of Christian soul from hell to purgatory and finally to salvation, kind of showing this climb out of hell um, through these three books, the Inferno, uh, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. Also during this time, it's important to really understand the context to which um, a lot of this stuff a lot of this artistic expression, a, a lot of kind of church expansion is going on. And so by the 14th century, we see um, the Black Death emerge, um, really a plague that arrived in Italy um, and within months um, killed 60% of uh, people within cities that were affected. And this ran throughout uh, Europe and the modern world at the time. And so it's these types of events that we see being the influential um, scenes for different literary works. Um, for instance, is Cameron, uh, the, the treatment of reality um, found within uh, Giovanni Boccaccio, um, who really survived the Black Death and um, lived to create these stories that would depict this particular plague, this pandemic, um, something that we're uh, not a burst to, to, to seeing something that's been quite familiar for, for many of us uh, as of a late. Sonnets uh, as well, uh, a, a type of uh, literary um, expression that really inaugurates one of the most important poetic forms in, in Western literature, uh, something that is being um, used as, as a form of expression, in, in addition to uh, stories, in addition to uh, music, and uh, something that we're going to see, or something that we see throughout the next uh, few hundred years of storytelling. Other popular literary works of the time uh, include uh, Canterbury Tales. Um, really modeled after the Decameron 
Um, these stories were, were written in, in Middle English and again, express this time period's focus on realism and on depicting people, stories, uh, current events in the world in, in as realistic way as possible, really creating kind of a, a sense of um, pathos with the reader, this uh, type of connection, emotional connection that we can create within these stories, um, which are uh, composed, particularly Canterbury Tales, composed in this kind of heroic couplets. And just as we talked about the education of women, we also see Christine de Pizon um, become the, the real first professional writer in Europe. And uh, she glorified Joan of Arc's achievements and really created this expression as one of the most um, prominent and early feminists uh, of um, civilization of, of, of this era. Uh, 